Good morning. Well, we've um, heard, it was very appropriate, wasn't it, that we heard in the, in the family time earlier in the church news about a lot of healing and also cases where we are encouraged to carry on praying for people um, because that's exactly the context of this reading which is set in the lectionary for today. Um, and the context, in case you don't remember the, um, what comes before that, um, is that <clears throat> very early in the days of the early church still, after the day of Pentecost, which of course we're not going to celebrate for a few more weeks, but when the Holy Spirit comes on the church with fire and wind and brings um, speaking in other languages and then gifts um, and great power for Jesus' followers, after that there comes a day when Peter and John are going together to pray in the temple, um, because of course the, temp the Jewish temple is the right place for the Jewish Christians, the Jewish believers, to be meeting their God. Um, not the only place, but that's where they go to pray with the other believers. And they meet a lame man. Um, I remember a song at school, I don't know if you had this one, Peter and John went to pray, they met a lame man on the way, and so on. Anyway, they, as you probably remember, they, he asks for money, and instead Peter calls on the Lord Jesus to heal him. And he gets up and walks, jumps, praises God, and a crowd gathers and provides Peter with a perfect opportunity to explain what's going on. And there's a, this is, I think, the second main sermon that Peter gives in the book of Acts. He's already given the sermon on the day of Pentecost when people hear it in all different languages. And now he gives a sermon in front of, I think, more, probably a, a more local audience. And the number of believers grows to, it says, about 5,000 men, so probably at least 10,000 people, maybe more. But this causes an uproar. And the, some of the Jewish leaders, especially um, from the Sadducees, and I'll say more about them in a minute, come and arrest Peter and John and hold them overnight so that they can quiz them the next morning. And that's the passage that um, Rachel's just read to us. Now, the main thing I want to um, say today, really, is, is very simple, that salvation is healing. Salvation is healing. And healing is at least a part of salvation. So it's appropriate we've been talking about healing and people who've been in hospital, people who are going into hospital, um, and people who don't need hospital but still need healing. Uh, all sorts of us. In fact, all of us surely have been through processes of healing in our lives to get to where we are today, and no doubt there'll be more to come. But what happens in this passage is that um, when, when Peter's giving this talk, he explains, um, they ask... It, by what power or what name have you done this thing? And Peter replies um, that they've, obviously they've done a gift of, a good deed of kindness to a man who was lame, and clearly they've healed him. And Peter ends up at the end of that reading by saying there is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be healed. It's the same word. I check this, it's the same word in Greek, and so I presume it was the same word when Peter was speaking. Um, healing saving. It's all part and parcel. It comes together. So if we're thinking about what's, what is the church here for and what are, we talk, what are we saying to people who are not in the church and perhaps we, we feel that people would benefit from being part of Jesus's body in the church, if we go and talk about salvation, we may get blank looks. People are not really sure what salvation is. It's become a very religious word, hasn't it? And if we were to talk about healing, then we, we would probably be much more on familiar territory. So is it as simple as that? Should we just say, come to church and be healed? Well, of course, we, we probably also know stories of people who don't seem to have been healed. Um, maybe ourselves, maybe in your own life, there are things that you've not been healed from. And maybe there are people close to us. And certainly, sadly, people still die. So clearly there isn't absolute healing. Christians still die, don't they? So there isn't healing every time we ask for it. So I was reflecting on what's going on here, and <clears throat> I think part of it is that we need to have a bigger picture of healing. We, I think we've become very accustomed to focusing on symptoms. And you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, what's wrong? You will point to some symptoms, won't you? And you will say, you know, I've got this pain, or I've got this, this problem, or I've got this, you know, bruise or spots or whatever it is, and the doctor will start to look at symptoms, and hopefully a good doctor will look at lots of symptoms and not just the one that you've referred to, but still, there's an attempt to 
treat the symptoms. And we have this paradigm almost of a pill for every ill, don't we? That there, there will be something, there will be a pill for that, or there will be some treatment or maybe an operation. But we, we need to recover a bigger picture, I'm sure. And I think very often if we, if we find people, especially deeply Christian faithful people who've lived a life of faith, we will see in them a bigger picture of healing. We may well find, especially perhaps as we get older, that they haven't been healed of absolutely everything. They have symptoms still. They still have things they can complain about. I'm sure many of us have things we could complain about in front of a doctor if we could actually get to see one. Um, but, or, or things that we could browse on the internet for he healing for. But the issue is that we need bigger healing. That's what the gospel is about. Deep healing. Holistic healing, in fact. And I think the English word holistic goes together with wholeness and health and healing. So it's not just in the Greek that health and salvation go together, but wholeness and healing go together in English. So um, the main thing, I think, is just to, to reflect on, on what it means to be healed and how we could work that into our expectations, maybe, and how we could work that into what we say to people who are not in the church. Do we talk about salvation or do we talk about healing? Do we try and strike a balance, sort of holistic healing? But certainly we shouldn't be separating them. And I think that's clear from how, how the, the New Testament church gets going. There's a lot of healing that goes on, and it's connected, it's the same word, it's connected to the salvation that they are preaching. There is no other name given under heaven by which we must be healed. Now, the, the particular opposition to, um, to Peter's preaching, and Peter and John's preaching there, comes from a group called the Sadducees. And it's interesting to, to read about what's going on there because the, the Sadducees um, were a group of the Jews at the time, of the Jewish leaders, who, as far as I understand, and this is no doubt caricature, but tended to align themselves more with the occupying powers of the Roman forces. The Pharisees, on the other hand, tended to be more purist and more rebels, more rebellious against the Roman um, authority and government. So. Perhaps we should be careful about just translating that into our time today, but there are perhaps parts of Christianity which seem to be much more comfortable with the government, with secular institutions and authorities, and there are parts of Christianity that are more radical, aren't there, and might even get labeled fundamentalist. And I don't think there's an easy answer here. I'm not going to say go with one or the other. I think it's it, we must avoid polarizing our faith into either it's all okay and the authorities and the secular system that we're in has nothing at all to worry about, that's not exactly right. But equally, we don't all need to go out and set ourselves against everything that seems to be going on or that the government might be proposing and so on. And it's easy to, to split into those two wings of a church, a sort of, I don't know, left and right wing or whatever it is. But there was opposition, serious opposition, to what Peter and John would, were saying I think it was more what they said than what they did. So why? Why were, they so, why were the, the Sadducees and others with them so bothered by this preaching? Well, it mentions in this passage actually, or, or just before the passage we had I think, in verse two, they were greatly, so the, the priests, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees were greatly disturbed because Peter and John taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That's a summary because the previous chapter tells us a lot more of what Peter said, but the key thing was that they preached in Jesus resurrection. And they said that Jesus has come back from the dead and everyone is coming back from the dead eventually. The resurrection from the dead. And, and it's clear from, from the sermon and also Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2 that the resurrection from the dead was a key point of this teaching. And of course that has radical implications. If Jesus has come back from the dead and is calling people to follow him in the expectation that those among us who have died will come back from the dead, that really can sow a different way of living, a different way of thinking, a different way of acting. And it could generate a massive movement. And it did, of course. The church took off, didn't it, in Jerusalem and very quickly when it was persecuted spread around the Roman Empire where there were Jewish communities and then beyond that and, and now around the world. So we need to think seriously about why authorities do get bothered about 
Christians preaching. Now, we might think that's something that we, we read about. We, we had a um, visitor from um, a charity pr- supporting persecuted Christians a couple of months ago. And certainly we hear about severe persecution of Christians in other parts of the world very often. It tends to be p- places quite a long way from here, and places where they don't speak English, places that we perhaps don't identify with quite so much. We know we must pray for people in various Far Eastern places and others, certain African places and so on. And we should stop and think, why is there such opposition to Christians even worshipping, even meeting together? But I think we should also reflect that here in the UK, we have also come under some opposition. At the very end of this, um, just after the reading that we had, the um, uh, but basically, sorry, just to, to fill in, we, we have a hearing of for Peter and John with these Jewish leaders. And it's interesting that it's an official institutional gathering to sort of interview them and try and work out what to do about this trouble that they seem to be causing. Now, if you look at who was, who was drawn into this meeting, it involved a high priest, someone called the high priest, Annas. Now, Annas, it turns out, was actually officially a high, high priest about 20 years before that, but he was still sort of high priest for life. That seems to be the case. Um, and then Caiaphas was apparently his son-in-law, and John apparently was the son of Caiaphas. So we have a bit of a dynasty here, don't we? A bit of a, a sort of male dynasty interviewing what's going on with these radicals. There's a lot of, of power here bound up with what we might now be tempted to see as sort of unelected, possibly unrepresentative power trying to deal with this new movement. And I think there's a critique there. I think Luke is, is critiquing what's, what, what's the setup here and where is the opposition coming from. It wasn't particularly from the rank and file Jewish people. It was from a power structure. Now, in what, what they conclude after hearing what Peter says is that they, they say, well, we can't do very much about this because everyone's seen that this man has been healed and that it was the name of Jesus that was involved. So they say they command Peter and John not to do any more, not to go, carry on speaking about Jesus, to silence them. And I'm sure you know what their response was to that. But in a sense, we have been, I want to suggest, we have been commanded not to speak about Jesus in our society. Now, it's not that we regularly get people telling us, by the way, we don't want to hear about Jesus, but I don't know, when was the last time you mentioned the name of Jesus outside of a church or family setting? For me, it was probably a very long time ago, if ever. We have effectively been commanded not to use the name of Jesus outside of church and private life, haven't we? And I think we need to reflect on that. And what's, what's happened here? Have we been silenced just as much as Peter and John were supposed to be silenced? So there's a challenge for all of us, certainly for me. Um, And wherever we work or wherever we move and wherever we go shopping and wherever we meet neighbors, there is this challenge, isn't there? Are we supposed to be using the name of Jesus a bit more? Are we supposed to be talking about perhaps healing in some deep sense? You know, not come to church and your symptoms will get treated necessarily, although that might happen. But there is healing in the name of Jesus. And the final words of this morning's reading very strident. There is no other name among the, all of heaven. Here they are in Jew- Jerusalem talking to Jews, you know, then, but they don't just say there's no other solution for the Jews. You know, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. That was part of their message. But no, they suddenly say under the whole of heaven, the whole Roman Empire and beyond, if there's anything beyond it, is where Jesus is the only way for healing. It's very, very bold. So, um, Finishing now, um, I I just want to reflect, really, and and leave you to to ponder, I suppose, what's the balance? So Peter and John, in their their response to the questioning, they say it was an act of kindness. They appeal to a shared value. It was kindness. A lame man, you know, that's certainly bad. Nobody wants to be lame. Healed, walking again. Wasn't this a good thing? They try to win over the audience by appealing to shared values, and that's part of what we can do in the public square. Kindness, relationships forgiveness, love, charity. There are so many values that we actually share with our society, and we can use those 
And in fact, it's not difficult to argue that they are largely a Christian heritage, in this, at least in this country. But at the same time, the uniqueness of Jesus, there's, it was by Jesus' name that this kindness was done, and there is no other name under heaven that can do it. How do we find the balance? Where do we sit? And how do we be shrewd and wise in our dealings with people and with structures, with organizations? Let me close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we, we're struck by the dynamism of the early church and by the boldness and the confidence of Peter and John, Barnabas and Paul, Stephen and so many others that we read about women whose names are given as church leaders in the letters. And Lord, we wonder what you want us to do today. How are we called to be bold, to bring the name of Jesus for healing in our society, in our politics, in our science, in our medicine, in our media, in our organizations and charities and social work? in our teaching, in our caring for people in the community, and in all the other things that you've called us to do. Lord, help us to find the way. Help us to find that way to bring the name of Jesus for healing in all the places where we go. Give us strength and give us your Holy Spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.